Welcome to today's Cardiometabolic Health Congress webinar titled Cardiovascular Disease in the South Asian Asian American Population, a Looming Typhoon and a Call to Action. We are pleased to have an esteemed faculty joining us for today's discussion, Dr. Chris Viajay. Dr. Viajay is a heart failure and preventative cardiologist, clinical professor of medicine at the University of Arizona and medical director of Arizona Heart Foundation. Dr. Viajay, welcome. Thank you very much, Chanel. <clears throat> I really appreciate and humbled and honored to be here to uh, discuss something very important. So uh, thanks to uh, CMHC Congress. Thank you, uh, uh, Chanel. Uh, thank you, Neha, Shpetim, Amanda, and the whole team for getting this organized because this is a very important topic and it's very timely because this is the month where the Asian American and Pacific Islanders are celebrating this month because this is their heritage month. And so I'm really honored to, to really address in this timely webinar, a few topics, uh, mainly focusing this time on South Asians because that's been my uh, expertise and my specialty for many years. And so we're gonna discuss about the South Asians living in the United States. We'll also discuss South Asians diaspora around the world. We'll also talk about the prevalence of what is called ASCVD or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which presents almost 20 years earlier in a South Asian community around the world and uh, earlier than many other ethnic communities. We'll also talk about why this is happening. We'll talk about the urgent need to educate communities and healthcare providers regarding the effective strategies, and also talk about earlier detection, risk assessment, culturally appropriate lifestyle interventions, and then evidence-based therapeutics. We'll also talk about the call to action. And what is the call to action? Can we increase our effort and our engagement uh, truly in an urgent way to reduce this disproportionate burden of cardiovascular disease in this community? So let's go talk about some of this aspect. So I named it the uh, looming typhoon. And I, it, I kind of titled it this way because indeed there is uh, a typhoon that is brewing and, and, and we could call it uh, the tip of the iceberg that is going to rupture. We could call it a volcano which is lying dormant, which could erupt any minute and, and so on. But the reality is that that we are indeed a walking time bomb and uh, people don't seem to realize it. And then, then suddenly things happen and, and then we accept and then we tolerate and then we move on with our lives, not realizing that, hey, if I had done this, this and this, could I have prevented a major event from happening? And that question comes up all the time. And, and the answer is we just don't know. We have predictive analytic tools, we have statistics, and we have a lot of these in our, in our bag of tricks. And to the extent that we know from a scientific perspective, we're gonna talk about that. We'll also uh, involve a, a little bit of the spirituality and the religiosity and the nutraceuticals and, and so on into the mix because many of them uh, have been validated in having some surrogate markers inside the human body be affected favorably. So we will talk about what is the impaired glucose tolerance, talk about the Masala trial, and then the Interheart, which is a huge trial. We'll talk about evidence. We'll talk about what uh, Annabel Vogman and Lata Palaniepin have really beautifully uh, presented in a manuscript uh, not too long ago. And then we'll talk about, is it, is it genetics? Is it environment? Is it a combination of both? And then we'll uh, summarize. So the question remains like who, you know, if you ask the five Ws, who, where, when, what, and why? You ask the question who, we talk about South Asians, we talk about where, the where is here and now. It's never been a better time to talk about the risk and prevent it in a primordial way. Primordial is even preventing the onset of the risk factors that lead to heart attack and diabetes and strokes, such as high blood pressure. Prevent onset of diabetes, prevent onset of dyslipidemia, prevent onset of obesity, prevent onset of all that inflammatory milieu that is dancing in glory inside the body, waiting for the plaque to rupture. 
when, right here and now, what and why is the one that we're going to be talking about and can we tackle this epidemic sooner and make an impact? So who are South Asians? Well, as you see in this slide, they consist of Indians, about 4.1 in the million in the US, Pakistanis, about half a million, Bangladeshis, a quarter million, Nepalis and Sri Lankans and Bhutanese and Maldivians. They all constitute South Asians and they're about 20 to 25% of the world's population, but we have about 40 to 50% of the global burden of this ASCVD. And South Asians represent 2% of the US population, but have threefold higher risk of cardiovascular disease than any other ethnic communities in the US. It's the fastest growing minority and almost increased by 40% in the last seven years. And the uh, Far East Asians, just like the, the Chinese and the Japanese and the uh, Vietnamese and Thailand, they have a less of a risk than the South Asians or the white Americans. So most recent uh, statistics in terms of the, uh, the number of, of people who are of South Asian, not only diaspora, which is around the world, but including India, if you, if you ask that question, there are 1.9 billion South Asians around the world. That's almost one in four is a South Asian. And the statistics from Canada just came out in 2021, which uh, suggests the Canadians are about 2.5 million in Canada out of 38 million. That's a big chunk, 4.8 million in the US out of 330 million, 2 million in the UK out of 68 million, and then another 30, uh, totally 32 million around the world outside of Southeast Asia. And uh, if you look at this slide from WHO, it's looking at the, the different color coded map. Uh, the red is the one that is in the danger zone. And the global uh, the burden of disease as suggested by this graph with ischemic heart disease while it is going down in the US, but the metabolic syndrome aspect, obesity, diabetes is going up, but the heart disease is going on in the US, but the opposite is happening in India and in Southeast Asia where the cardiovascular disease and mortality is only trending upwards. And same thing is happening with cerebrovascular disease, which is stroke. Uh, which is also in orange now, but slowly turning into red because of high prevalence of hypertension that is slowly creeping into India from the northeastern portion uh, of, uh, of the South Asia and the Asia itself. This slide is telling us something very interesting. In 20, uh, 1998, they suggested and predicted that the world population of diabetes will be around 300 million, out of which the developed nations will have 72 million. And then the, uh, by, 20, by 1995, uh, and then by 2025, we'll have 72 million. And, by, and the developing nations, like in India, we will have about 228 million people with diabetes. But guess what? We have already, in 2023, we have already surpassed that prediction. We already now have 537 million adults living with diabetes, and this number is only predicted to rise to 643 in the next seven years and almost 783 million in the next 20 years or so. We're looking at a billion people almost with diabetes by 2050. That's not right. Why is it going up? Why it continues to go up? We ought to be talking about mitigating the prevalence of disease with all kinds of technology, new medications, and education about lifestyle and beyond. No, it's the opposite is happening in that space. Opposite is happening for South Asians for cardiovascular mortality. And the evidence is there. We're going to talk about some evidence-based clinical trial from the National you know, Health and Nutrition Survey, Inter-Heart Study, the PURE Study, Dr. Selim Yusuf from Canada has pioneered in these. CAR study, Masala is going on for the last 10 plus years, uh, by, headed by um, Alka Kanaya from UCSF and Namrata Kandula from Chicago, doing some phenomenal work. We'll talk about that. Mesa, the Glass Vegas, Sahara, are all ongoing studies. Now, what is the problem? What is the South Asian problem? Well, they have a problem, number one, of what is called insulin resistance or a pre-diabetic state. So they have a comp component of abdominal obesity and high triglyceride, a low HDL, 
borderline blood sugar level, borderline blood pressure level, and of course the the obesity from a definition point of view is not there. Their BMI is on the lower end, but the waist to hip circumference is very high. And that constitutes metabolic syndrome. So they have a higher prevalence of metabolic syndrome. Is this translating to high cardiovascular event is a big question. And the answer is probably yes, because the metabolic syndrome is uh, translates to a higher level of the LDL particle number, the smaller size, the lower levels of good cholesterol called HDL, and increased uh, levels of pro-inflammatory state. Inflammation is a big player in South Asians and con contributing to the plaque rupture that leads to a heart attack or a stroke. And we are seeing pre increased prevalence of diabetes. We are seeing increasing prevalence of metabolic syndrome in South Asians around the world, not just in the US. And in addition, the plaque that is building up inside the arteries of the heart is happening almost 10 to 20 years earlier. And the South Asians have a small artery diameter but the problem may be that the outside that inner lumen of the, of the blood vessel, the plaque may be accumulating outside what is similar to what is called transplant vasculopathy, making the lumen diameter smaller, where the plaque is building up outside the blood vessel uh, long before it actually encroaches into the lumen. And they also have a very interesting genetic marker, and that is called lipoprotein little a. And genetically, the prevalence of lipoprotein little a is somewhere around 30 to 35% in South Asians, which is a little bit less than it is in Afro-Americans. But the isoforms of the lipoprotein little a in Afro-Americans may not be translating to heart attacks, but some isoforms that South Asians have may be directly independently predicting uh, coronary artery disease and events. Low daily consumption of fruits and vegetables, lack of regular exercise, and high waist to hip ratio, all of this are, are probably contributing to the risk. And truly, when you look at all of this risk uh, ratio, we may be underestimating the risk of cardiovascular disease, even with all of the pooled uh, risk equation we'll talk about in a minute. So what is the problem again, when you look at ASCVD in South Asians in US, that is SAUS, stands for, you'll see right from the top, uh, probably a genetic or family history, and then you add all of the environmental aspects to it. Uh, they now develop uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia, a lot of psychosocial stressors, and then the diabetes creeps in, blood pressure is a big player with stressors, life stressors of, of daily living. Physical inactivity is a big player with globalization, overweight, smoking is reduced significantly across South Asians all over the world. But the diet component may be something that we need to talk about. There is a nutritional transition that is happening significantly and may be a big player as well. And then, of course, the inflammation is contributing to it, the metabolic syndrome and the lipoprotein little a. So genetic first, and then a, an environmental, maybe 80 to 90% when you add to the genetic predisposition, perhaps that's what is the problem. So what is the, the plaque? What is the plaque? How, how does it actually grow? What is the genesis of the plaque? Let's talk about that quickly so that we understand uh, where we are going. When we understand the basics, then we know that what we need to do is what is called stabilizing the inner lining of the blood vessel is the name of the game. And stabilizing the inner lining means endothelium is the inner lining. And if you look at the progression of cardiovascular disease and coronary artery disease, you'll see that the blood vessel is pretty normal when you see the picture here, the, this is transection. And then it's, there is a minimal plaque that is accumulating the yellow, uh, what looks like a crescent moon, is accumulating outside the cavity of the blood vessel. And then with time, the plaque slowly increases and by the time the plaque is encroaching into the cavity, it is already occupied more than 70% of the circumference of the blood vessel. And then it goes in to the cavity of the blood vessel. And what you see in the angiogram is a small little plaque, maybe 20, 30%. But what you don't know is that that is indeed the tip of the iceberg. And everything underneath is the huge necrotic plaque, lipid core building underneath that endothelium, which may be at risk of rupture because of some unstable 
blood sugar level, unstable blood pressure, unstable inflammatory milieu, un unstable cholesterol level, and beyond. So this is how the uh, you know the tra the transverse view we, we showed. So this is the longitudinal view. You look at the inside of the artery. The plaque is building up, but it builds up outside the vessel first, and then when it comes into the blood vessel, then you detect the plaque and you say, "Oh yeah, yeah, 20, 30 percent." Not realizing that this 30 or 40 percent of the plaque may be at risk of rupture because it may be not stable. It may be unstable. It may be soft. So how does the plaque build up? So this is a very beautiful picture that I've uh, taken more than 20 years ago. Uh, uh, we, we talked about the, the volcanic rupture of the plaque that happens inside the cavity of the blood vessel. And how does it happen? And uh, we've had some incredible conversations over the years. And so the lining that you see over here uh, on, the, on the top uh, portion of the graph is called the endothelium. Endothelium is a monolayer. And the endothelium is, according to me, the most important organ in the body. When you put them side to side and you go across the whole body, it will occupy uh, almost three times the circumference of the earth. That's how big this organ is because it's lining every blood vessel in the body. Now think for a second. If this is lining every blood vessel, this is the largest organ. And don't you think that we need to be respecting this organ and stabilizing it and protecting it and making sure that this doesn't become dysfunctional? So let's talk about that function of the endothelium then. So the function of the endothelium is 5-4. Number one, so you see these line, these layers. In between the two is a little gap, and that is a permeability barrier is where it is stabilizing it. So now the barrier is, is distorted. And so you can get this LDL seeping underneath with small dense particles going underneath that endothelium. And the monocyte also seeps underneath the endothelium. And as it seeps, you get to the blue zone. And the blue zone is where the LDL gets oxidized and the monocyte is becoming a macrophage. And then the macrophage is taking up the oxidized LDL and oxidation of LDL can happen because of so many different reasons. We can talk ad nauseum about the, the, the ways that LDL gets oxidized, but mainly, simplistically, those risk factors that we keep talking about, when they are not controlled, the LDL is getting oxidized. Simplistically, then it forms a foam cell. And when the foam cell now gets activated, it is now releasing a lot of cytokines. It is releasing cytokines and is contributing to the interleukins of the world and the TNF alpha. And they are now recruiting and driving the smooth muscle from the layer below. And they're slowly coming up towards the surface or the closer to the endothelium and forming that fibrous tissue. Fibrin is increased, collagen is increased, proteoglycan is increased. The, the smooth muscle is forming and they're forming a beautiful, stable helmet, a beautiful, stable cap. We call it the fibrous cap. Now, if it's a helmet, good for you. If it is not a helmet, if it is a baseball cap and you're driving at 120 miles uh, an hour in a 30 mile zone on a motorbike, now you are at risk of a head injury. So this uh, uh, you know, soft baseball cap is not going to protect you. So that is the way we have to be envisioning this endothelial function. So number one, it acts as a permeability barrier. Number two, it acts as a balancing uh, organ that is balancing the clotting and the bleeding. So it's like a cut. When you cut yourself, suddenly the platelets are coming. A lot of uh, clotting factors are coming and start trying to block it and prevent the bleeding from happening forever and ever. So the endothelium releases the most powerful clotting factor in the body called pi one, and the most powerful bleeding factor that balances it is also produced by the endothelium called the TPA, which we use as a clot buster. And the uh, also balancing act number three of vasoconstriction, vasodilatation, most powerful vasoconstriction narrowing the blood vessel is caused by the endothelin, which is the hormone released by the endothelium and angiotensin. And then the most powerful vasodilator, which balances it, is the endothelium derived nitric oxide, which is also released by the endothelium. So now think three functions. The fourth one is releases good cytokines and bad cytokines. And if you have bad cytokines, it's now recruiting a lot of smooth muscles and forming the plaque. And then if the fibrin, collagen are not adequate, or if the risk factors inside the bloodstream are not controlled, then the cap is not becoming fibrous or, or thicker or protecting uh, the, the endothelium from rupturing. And so, uh, so, so many of these, right? 
And then the fifth one is it acts as a, a buffer. It acts as a transducer or biomechanical forces at branch vessel protecting these plaques from rupturing. And those are the five functions. So now you tell me the largest garden in the body has got the most amazing function that stabilizes you. If you develop a plaque, stabilizes you from having harm because of blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol. So every time you do something in terms of eating healthy, you're stabilizing the endothelium. If you're exercising, you stabilize. You're making the endothelium more consolidated and more solidified and more powerful and more functional to protect you from harm, including from diabetes and blood pressure and heart attack and stroke and cancer and trauma and psychosocial risk factors. So you think about it. That's what is happening here. The platelets are now accumulating if there's a cut in the endothelium because it's dysfunctional and suddenly underneath necrotic core, which is extracellular lipids and the smooth muscle cells, now they all are now really uh, enjoying themselves in uh, creating a volcanic eruption of the plaque into the bloodstream, which causes clotting factors to be released and blocks the whole blood vessel. That's a major heart attack or a major stroke. That's what we need to be avoiding. And in a diabetic, as you see in this slide, the inner lining is the one that you need to stabilize because you go from the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the genetics are, are taking uh, a major role uh, to begin with. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then the blood pressure seeps in in a diabetic, and then the insulin resistance seeps in, and the skeletal muscle creates what is called increased free fatty acid, hyperglycemic situation, and then the TNF-alpha and the lipemia are contributing to adipo adipocyte is the largest endocrine organ in the body, and they are releasing a lot of neurohormones, and the uh, liver is producing a lot of the proteins that are contributing to the inflammation with CRP that we can detect, fibrinogen we can detect, PI-1 is increasing, causing thrombosis. So in a diabetic, it's again a vicious complex conundrum as we see in this uh, slide. So as you see in this slide, it starts off at the bottom with the risk factors, and then with blood pressure, the left ventricle becomes sicker, and then the relaxation of the heart becomes an issue. The arteries are slowly getting narrowed and blocked with plaque, and then suddenly heart attack can happen, bl lack of blood, blood flow to the circula so circulatory aspect, now causing arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, sudden cardiac arrest. There is what is called remodeling happening in the left ventricle, the ventricle enlarges, and the ventricle now, uh, because of that, there is heart failure and then death, and kidney failure is a big player. So what do we know? What is the evidence? Well, we know from WHO that 50% of all heart attacks in Indian men occur under 50 years of age. And India accounts for about 60% of the world's heart disease burden, despite having less than 20% of the world's population. And even in a city like Hyderabad in India, 21 in five already have diabetic, the adult population one in five. That's a lot. And they did an interesting study in young children, in high school children in, in, in Europe. And they found that even 13 to 16 years of age, uh, the, uh, the kids are having a higher fasting plasma insulin level, higher fasting glucose level, higher incidence of impaired fasting glucose, and they remain significant even after adjustment for central adipocity. And Anup Mishra and gang from India have done phenomenal work over the years in obesity and adiponectin and leptin and abdominal fat, visceral fat, or and subcutaneous fat. And they looked at uh, the Caucasians, Blacks, and they compared to, South, to South Asians. It looks like South Asians have a very high level of visceral adiposity uh, compared to the subcutaneous depot uh, and compared to Blacks and compared to Caucasian. And this may be a major risk factor as shown in Masala trial as well. Well, Alka and uh, Namruta are doing a lot of work, uh, almost 100 manuscripts are out there. Look up Masala, you'll come across so many. But the most important thing that they're finding out is that abdominal visceral fat, liver fat attenuation, pericardial fat, fat around the heart, uh, are all uh, significantly higher in South Asians, and they have a higher prevalence and a higher burden of coronary artery calcium in South Asians compared to all of the other ethnic population. They also found compared to MESA, another large study that is ongoing, again, abdominal visceral fat is associated with impaired fasting glucose, and diabetes was present in 23%. Again, that is one in four of South Asians already having diabetes, uh, even below the age 
uh, of, uh, of of 60. So very interesting. And then when Salim Yusuf did this large study called Interheart, looked at heart attack patients of 12,000 and then compared to 14,000 controls, and they looked at, they went back, it's a case control trial, and they went back and looked at all of the risk factors. They found that there are nine modifiable risk factors, the same thing that you already know, smoking to diabetes, to lipids, to obesity, to hypertension, and you know, lack of fruits and vegetables stood very tall, Type 2 diabetes is still very tall, very high prevalence. High prevalence of ApoB to ApoA ratio. What is ApoB is the precursor of the bad cholesterol called LDL. What is ApoA is the precursor of the good cholesterol, the HDL. So when you look at this ratio, the ratio was much higher in South Asian population, suggesting that that ApoB, which is a measure of LDL particle size, I intermediate, uh, intermediate lipid and VLDL, very low density, intermediate density, very low density, which is a measure of triglyceride as well, and lipoprotein little a, which is a genetically mediated, uh, which also is incorporated into the ApoB level. And ApoB is very high in South Asians compared to many, almost every other ethnic population. And they can, they, uh, there is low consumption of fruits and vegetables, lack of exercise, and all of that is contributing. And Lata Palaniyappan from Stanford is doing amazing work. And, and uh, they did it through American Heart Association, a large, they collated all kinds of data from all over. And we did something similar with Dinesh Kalra and I and our group. And we published that more recently. This was in 2018. We published in 2021. A similar thing, looking at what is it? What is the problem? High prevalence of metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, diabetes, and uh, compared to any other ethnic community. And South Asians born in the US show evidence of altered metabolic profile, altered lipid profile, again, in young adulthood compared to young adults of European descent. So we got to start young in terms of taking care of ourselves. Women with gestational diabetes were 3.2 times more likely. And then when you compare South Asians living in India, the South Asians, the US, have a high level of triglyceride and high LDL particle number and low levels of HDL, which is interesting. Maybe a, uh, the transition, uh, acculturation, and all of that is ongoing. Lipo, what is lipoprotein little a? This is a very powerful marker. Every South Asian about the age of 30 should get lipoprotein little a done. And I'll tell you what else we need to do to take care of yourself uh, and uh, be empowered to take care of yourself by knowing a little bit more about your risk. And LDL, like particle, is attached out there is a, you know, is a covalent, uh, it's a two ApoA uh, are covalently bound to one molecule of ApoB100, which itself is an independent predictor, is bound by the disulfide bridge at the bottom of the slide. You see the Kringles uh, that is uh, outside of this bigger orange circle globe. And then you see those Kringles, that's the LP little a, and they have what's called the KIV, uh, and so many of them, they're all the isoforms, and they have homology with what is called plasminogen. Now, plasminogen is, uh, as I mentioned, plasminogen activator inhibitor in, in diabetics is, is very high in strong heart study. We know that. The plasminogen is a prothrombotic. So a risk of thrombosis is very high in people who have high LP little a. If they're more than three times the upper limit of normal, the risk of heart attack is high, risk of clotting tendencies, risk of stroke is very high. So here is a study that is ongoing, it was called the Horizon trial, where they're looking at this, what is called antisense oligonucleotide. And they found that this phelacarsin, which is the drug they're studying in phase two clinical trial, is reducing LP little a uh, with 20 milligram sub-Q injection weekly by 80% in six months. This is huge. So will this translate to a cardiovascular event reduction is the big question and that's ongoing. And let's hope that this uh, you know, uh, performs well and comes to fruition because th this may be a, a drug of choice for South Asians primarily. And then when we compared uh, all of the data from between Caucasians, Black, Hispanic, uh, South Asian, Native Americans, compared it to, compared with uh, on the, uh, you see on the row, you have the coronary disease, you have diabetes, you have, uh, and then you have all the risk factors with hypertension, uh, cholesterol, ApoB, ApoA1, 
uh, and, and BMI, you'll see the BMI is very low in South Asians, they're all in, in red. Uh, and then the ApoB to ApoA1 is one of the highest in among all ethnic communities. And their triglyceride is very high, 70%. HDL is very low. And also pre-diabetic state is extremely high and prevalence of coronary artery disease is higher than all of the other ethnic groups, as you see, almost constituting about 11% of the population. So what do we know about South Asians? Well, we, as you know, for the evolution of man has happened uh, over millions of years, right? And you see, you know, to simplistically, you know, have we come from Australopithecus to the Neanderthals to the Homo erectus, and then now we are slowly the Homo sapien, and now we are slowly becoming the Homo obesians, is what I call it. That is my terminology, where you see the last person uh, at the bottom uh, is looking at a typical South Asian. It looks like that with the abdominal obesity and has a characteristic uh, persona and a walk that is inimitable. So what about the body composition when you're born? And if you look at this slide, Yajnik has done some phenomenal work. And you look at the pie chart, you'll realize that the percent muscle is very low compared to the Caucasian. And the percent of fat is very high uh, compared to the Caucasians. And so uh, even though the body weight itself is low, but it's so disproportionately affected with the high fat content and a low muscle content. So sarcopenia may be another thing that we need to talk about with building muscle strength and muscle bulk in South Asians as we grow older. So what about uh, the concept of gene, the thrifty gene concept in this next slide? You'll know that uh, the time was when there was famine and there was the genes that are actually adapted to the environment and they were now storing uh, the simple sugars and they were converting it to abdominal fat. And there was a selective advantage for storage for a rainy day. Hey, we will be able to use it at times of famine. And that was very frequent uh, in those days and the lack of food, lack of uh, 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 you know, healthy uh, food and, and all of that was a big, big deal. And so the genes are adapted to some extent in, in assuming that, hey, uh, maybe something will happen and then we'll have uh, enough for a, a rainy day. So there is low caloric intake, high energy expenditure, low BMI, and then urbanization happened. And suddenly we have all kinds of food available for us and we have all kinds of technology available, all kinds of urbanization concepts have evolved to the extent of increased calorie intake, into increase, lower energy expenditure, higher BMI, higher waste to hip ratio, and South Asians have not kept up with all of the uh, health aspects that we need to be protecting ourselves from, and, and thereby there is a, a epidemic of uh, diabetes and heart disease in the South Asian community 20 years earlier to any other ethnic community in the world. So is it genes? There are quite a few genetics that we already uh, now identified. The genetic variants are, are quite a few out there. And we see the PNLA, TCF, uh, 7L2 genotypes. And uh, Shaker Kadiration is doing some great work in Boston, looking at the atherosclerotic genes. He's looking at 9P21 locus in uh, some Indian population, looking at uh, drug metabolism-mediated genes. Uh, some of the, the Indians have... Uh, we're not able to tolerate the uh, the statins well because of uh, perhaps the statin intolerant and maybe genetically driven. And we're not able to uh, break through. There is breakthrough uh, clopidogrel with plaque buildup and, and occlusive coronary arteries, maybe because of uh, CYP2C9 or CYP2C19 genotype that may be prevalent as well. So here is a case of a 40-year-old Bangladeshi who uh, uh, his father had an MI at age 49 non-smoker, BMI is 31, blood pressure is okay, otherwise it's unremarkable, blood sugar is 90, A1C is 5.8, how do you manage this patient? So you look at the uh, uh, ACC, uh, the, what is called the uh, uh, pooled uh, cohort uh, uh, equation, right? So the, the risk calculator is telling us that a 10-year risk for this person is only 2.4%. So it will tell you, oh, no need for statin, no need for this, no need for that. 
and don't worry, everything is going to be hunky-dory. But the minute you add the Q-risk-3 calculator, which is a more powerful uh, indicator, which adds in many of the other variables like ethnicity, like uh, status of diabetes, like chronic kidney disease, inflammatory disease states like lupus, and many other inflammatory conditions contributing in South Asian to a higher inflammatory milieu. If this one is adding many of those into the equation, thereby suddenly the 10 year risk is 7.6%. Now more than 5%, there's an indication for an aggressive moderate intensity statin and bring down the risk. And, and that's where the all of those risk calculators out there are faulty for South Asians. So what are the tools you will see uh, many screening tools, which one to use, very confusing. You will see there are 200 risk factors have been reported, which risk factors should we actually test for. And then there are so many imaging uh, methodology from carotid IMT to coronary artery plaque assessment with CT coronary calcium score, ankle brachial index, brachial uh, you know, vasoreactivity testing, vascular compliance testing, microvascular reactivity, my goodness, it's so confusing. Let's simplify what is the, the big one. You all know, you already know your cholesterol. You need to check that. You know you want to check your A1C level. I'm talking about somebody at age 30, starting off and beyond, all the way up to age 85. And you got to be testing this regularly, monitoring, tracking, and look at that and beyond. Now look at your Q-risks, uh, three equation, and look at the risk because the family history is important. Get your coronary artery calcium score. We're advocating at age 30. And lipoprotein little a, measure that. How many of you know your lipoprotein little a? And if it is more than 60, there is an indication if they have coronary artery disease to get a pheresis therapy. The coronary artery CT angiogram with what is called AI and machine learning imaging, there are a few companies that has already developed the technology where you can now look at the plaque morphology and it tells you whether you have at risk for plaque rupture, is it stable, is it soft plaque, is it a stable plaque, is it hard, is it calcified, does it have enough fibrous tissue? And uh, all of that is very fascinating. Some people may need that extra step if they do see some plaque that uh, is present, or if your risk is higher and the, your coronary artery calcium score is zero, you can still have soft plaque, which may not manifest in your coronary artery calcium score. So do all of that, the risk score, the calcium scoring, and LP little a, beyond your lipid and your kidney testing and your uh, your, your A1C levels. Uh, know your blood sugar level, know your blood pressure, know your body weight, know your abdominal obesity, get your abdominal fat way down below. Uh, uh, and, and then the genetic scoring, uh, we're not quite sure where we need to go, time will tell. And then when you look at CT coronary artery calcium score, we think that the minute you have an LDL more than 100, I'm sorry, coronary artery calcium score more than 100, we put a, a study here, this is our paper with Dinesh Kalra, myself and many others, we, uh, we are recommending that our LDL should be as low as 30. Uh, at least 30, the new 70 was our editorial. And uh, because if your calcium score is more than 100, clearly the risk is higher. And to uh, look at the epidemic, uh, look at so many actors in their 30s and uh, their 40s uh, are all dead. Uh, we know the celebrities are dying. And so what are the barriers? Well, the barriers obviously uh, you know, uh, are, are quite a few. Let's talk about that. Well, the access to care, availability of technology, affordability of medications and technology, acceptability of the cultural nuance, big four A's, and we talk about all this. So yes, the access to care from the Canadian community study is telling us that if you, they have so low socioeconomic strata, the STOH is a big player. Cultural discrimination, geographical constraints are a big part of lack of access to transportation, language barriers, and the South Asian women who are not as independent as men due to implicit gender bias that is very high in South Asian culture. And then they maintain a lot of religious values and dietary and healthcare practices. And they may not be interested or really believing in the Western allopathic medicine. And that entrenched belief may be a negative because you have to really look at the evidence from a scientific standpoint beyond your belief, which is all good. Believe in many other but also believe in the evidence-based clinical trial with 
among South Asian um, with the Western uh, evidence data, lack of support from families and communities. And then we have English language in some communities, underrepresentation in clinical research, a big one. Hardly South Asians don't want to participate because they are afraid to participate. Oh, I don't want my uh, you know, personal data. Oh, I don't want my LDL to be known. I don't want my uh, you know, uh, address and cell phone number to somebody. There is a fear. And so they don't participate. Then you don't know. Then the, the, and then there is heterogeneity within subgroups also is a big player. And then there are 50 different dietary patterns in South Asians. So uh, again, the heterogeneity of it all makes it makes broad generalization difficult. What about availability? Uh, well, healthcare providers may lack the knowledge about South Asian ancestry being a high risk condition. This is extremely important to know that they need aggressive strategies in management, early detection, and little education in schools regarding diabetes or heart disease. Availability of technology is there, and yet we are not really monitoring or, or tracking or blood pressure because of the fear or whatever happens, happened. Healthier food choices are more expensive, such as fruits and vegetables. Gym membership is very expensive. And then the copay and the medications not affordable. So there is a concept called food is medicine that White House and Rockefeller have come together with private partnership where almost $8 billion are being spent. And this probably should be adopted in South Asian populations sooner with medically tailored groceries, medically tailored prescriptions, medically tailored food as a theme that we need to be adopting so that we eat better and get enough exercise, reduce the lifestyle risk factors. And then the acceptability of lack of feeling of belonging and uh, entrenched belief system, not accepting allopathic care and uh, prefer Ayurvedic and prefer traditional, but it probably has to be a, a complementary basis that we need to be addressing rather than pushing one out there is mistrust in research, inability to participate in preventive programs, a lot of mental health issues, a lot of fear. All of that is a big, big issue. So what do we know? In summary, lipid abnormalities is a big deal. Pre-diabetic is a big deal. Diabetes prevalence is only increasing. South Asians have a two to four fold increase in prevalence, diabetes and heart disease. And we have a very characteristic uh, APOB level, which is high, which uh, again, incorporates LP little a level inside its of, of itself. So uh, get your APOB check, get your LP little a check, get your coronary artery calcium assessed. If it, it looks like your risk is higher, more than 5%, and be on a statin, and the risk doesn't come down, LDL doesn't come down, you may have a genetic predisposition. Think about other way of treatment strategy. Talk to your doctor. Have your doctor get educated about South Asians. Tell them about some of the uh, literature. We will talk about it at the end and we'll be making it available for you to have it given to your doctors. And if you're a healthcare professional, uh, you know, learn about it, read about it. And, uh, and then the increase in fru fruits and vegetable consumption, increase in exercise and extremely important. Our cut points are lower for South Asians than for any other population. Body mass index should be less than 23 blood pressure less than 130 over 70. Total cholesterol, we say less than 120. LDL less than 70 for everybody. We have coronary artery disease less than 50. And if you're a little bit higher risk with diabetes less than 30. And we say, get your HDL higher and get your triglyceride lower, closer to 100. Get, and then get your A1C less than 6.5 and get your LP little a less than 30 if you have uh, access to it. Enjoy grains, wheat, millets, vegetables, fruits, beans, nuts, uh, again, avoid many of the other stuff like ghee, uh, butter, palm oil, trans fat, coconut product. It's all, we want to debunk the myth. People think that statins are a killer. No, statins, we have evidence with every statin that they're protecting. And with statins, we think that maybe there is answer of diabetes. For every new answer of diabetes, you're preventing seven uh, cardiovascular event. Remember, one to seven is the ratio. Don't worry about the answer of diabetes. The people who are getting it or the ones who are already at risk, it is unmasking it. And so now it's unmasked. You have to be on a statin anyway and protect from a heart attack or stroke. That's the message we need to be giving on a constant basis. Olive oil, cooking, I don't like it. Avocado is a great oil. Can canola oil, they have high smoke point. Olive oil, use it raw for salads, which is there, so you don't lose the benefit. 
and avoid sugary products. Anything that you ask the question, if I had to add, if this, what I'm eating has added sugar in it, then don't go there. And then again, this algorithm-based uh, intervention and risk assessment, testing, lifestyle advice, drug therapy, don't hesitate to be on medication as much as you're able to tolerate it, continue, make effort to tolerate it because it is evidence-based uh, medications that is now advocating uh, for many populations, even though for South Asians, dedicated interventional trial is really needed and we are working on getting that together. Increase awareness uh, with the way that you can, uh, share decision-making with your doctor or healthcare provider, initiate primordial preventive strategies, preventing onset of diabetes or blood pressure, culturally competent, cultural sensitive, cultural intelligence, know about South Asians because the culture is so deep-rooted that you will suddenly realize, oh my God, this, uh, cultures go back in South Asians, you know, more than five to 10,000 years. So learn about them rather than push them back. So not just cultural humility or competence, but cultural intelligence is the new word. Diversity consciousness is the new word. And deploy the digital technology available in tracking and monitoring and, and educate your peers and perform faith-based intervention, churches, mosques, temples, the community centers, uh, policy changes we are working on with all the societies. We are encouraging clinical trial participation. Utilize data with so many claims data, pharmacy data. And then El Camino has a beautiful heart center in California for South Asian. And Advocate has one in Chicago. And a lot of the societies are all having uh, South Asian uh, uh, plenary sessions uh, with NLA. We've been participating in many of this. And then the industry has to really come forth and support the South Asian and reduce the risk through interventional trial and through help with registry creation and community engagement, grassroots uh, advocacy. HR 3131 passed the House, but it's stuck in the Senate. It's still not passed from the Senate. And there'll be a large grant that will be coming out so that we can perform large scale registry and clinical trial. And we need it is stuck in the uh, Education, Labor, Pensions Committee in the Senate. We need to continue to do while we are waiting for all of that. Faith-based intervention, healthcare, healthcare, cricket matches and event, continue to educate and do it in school. Re, uh, restart the process, regroup with the kids and start a, at an early age and use technology uh, for all of the monitoring that's available out there. Many of them are fairly accurate. And then uh, registry trial is what we are working on. Again, lifestyle modification, diet, fish, if you eat fish is a good thing. Some fish are good, not all fish is good. Like tilapia is not good for you. Tilapia is not good for you. Too fatty fish, then it'll actually go the other way. Abdominal obesity should be aggressively managed. Increase muscle strength, muscle mass. Do weight training exercises. Not that you need to become Mr. America or, or Miss America and do pumping iron, but at least tone them and develop enough strength as we go older. Consider aspirin, statin. If you cannot tolerate it, the bempitoic acid uh, with azidomide is showing significant reduction in page statin intolerant patients. And we have agents like PCSK9 antibody, Inclisiran is available. EPA, uh, icosopentanoic acid only agent is also available showing significant reduction if they have diabetes or one other risk factor or they have cardiovascular events already with strength, they ought to be on this agent, which is protecting them significantly. And then many of the agents that we ought to be uh, looking at include GLP-1 receptor agonists. You haven't studied that, but I believe that there is a big role in South Asians along with SGLT2 inhibitors. And then the yoga, bhangra, garba, I call it yobhaga, meditation, spirituality. Remember, every one of these things are stabilizing your endothelium unconditional love, spirituality, religiosity, all of them decrease your inflammatory markers, stabilize the endothelium so you don't develop the plaque rupture and have an event. So what if you have blood pressure, diabetes, or cholesterol, if you can take care of them by preventing uh, the plaque from rupturing by stabilizing the endothelium, and now you're 95 years of age, now, what does it matter, right? You've lived a full life with good quality of life. That's what we need to be talking about. Many ongoing studies, and then many studies in the UK, uh, over here with Caliber, Fish Meal, Aim High, Start Sahara, Class Act, Namaste in Canada, and then lots of resources. Lata Palaniapin is pioneering in Stanford, and then uh, British Heart Foundation. Uh, a lot of them are working uh, very hard in, in England, improving South Asian health. 
and Milan Gupta and the gang. Uh, I helped him put together their uh, Sansar website here for their uh, slide kit uh, in their Sansar resource in Canada. And then the thin fat Indian, that's what we are called. The Indians are thin uh, by body, body mass index, but fat internally because of abdominal obesity. We need to completely change the paradigm and completely uh, flip it. And low birth weight and obesity, again, during pregnancy, very healthy eating habit, extremely important. So the child and the mother are protected and safe. And so many of the publications over here, so we published the cardiometabolic consensus, renal consensus document. We also published the uh, uh, call to action paper. And we also, uh, the eMedics Index, the Lipid Association of India is doing some amazing work uh, every year annually. Uh, and so uh, uh, I'll stop here with uh, the uh, the beautiful message from Aldous Huxley, uh, which again talks about the sense of hope. It epitomizes the concept that, hey, you can do it through prevention, prevention, and prevention, but we'll start off at a at a low level, at the lowest rung of the ladder. And he says, the rung of a ladder was never meant to rest upon, but only to hold a man's foot long enough to enable him to put the other somewhat higher. So again, I thank you uh, for your attention. I, I truly believe that, yes, hopefully, uh, you know, we have uh, learned something, but let's go through some question and answers. I'll have Chanel take it from here. We'll come back to Q&A and then we'll summarize. Again, a big thank you, Chanel. Thank you again, Dr. Vijay. Thank you so much for that enriching presentation. Uh, let's move to our Q&A segment. If you have a question for Dr. Vijay, please submit that question via the Q&A box in Zoom. I'll read these out loud for our audience and our speaker. Let's go ahead and start off with our first question. Is there a difference in risk factor burden and incidence of CVD in South Asians born in the U.S. versus individuals who are born and reside in South Asia? Oh, Chanel. So the question is, is there a difference between South Asians risk factors uh, in uh, living in the U.S. versus uh, someone who is living in India? So the answer to that uh, is that we don't know. We think we know. So South Asians in India, we've had a lot of studies which again suggest that their risk of diabetes is higher. The risk of cardiovascular disease is higher. The events of cardiovascular events are getting higher. And we also know the same thing is happening in the U.S. with risk factors of South Asians in the U.S. is higher with high triglyceride, low HDL, all of the things we talked about. But the comparator data between the two was done only in one or two studies. And in one study, it looks as if the South Asians in the U.S. may have a higher uh, level of uh, diabetic uh, conditions or pre-diabetic state. Now, we don't know uh, because we had to study large populations and large differences, and then the urbanization concept and the acculturation concept. All of that is being studied in Masala trial in the U.S. population, but the uh, comparator is mainly historic, but no head-to-head -head comparison directly. But uh, we know that South Asians in the U.S., compared to other ethnic populations have a much higher risk. So compared to the one in Indian, I believe strongly that South Asians uh, around the world probably have similar risk. If you think about migration, it happened in the 1970s and many were going from India to Singapore. So we have some data from Singapore about migra migratory Indian. And then it happened in South Africa. And then it happened in Trinidad in Jamaica in the 60s and 70s. And then comes the 70s and 80s, it is happening in England and in the US. So we have data from the 80s, 90s, and uh, you know the Z uh, and the millennials. We, these, these are all younger populations. So the, the, the amount of uh, events happening in this population is slowly increasing, but not, not large enough for us to track them and detect and prove a cause and effect relationship. I think that will come with time because the population that has migrated has been happening only in the last 30, 40 years. So we will know as the population is aging, we will know that there may be higher events, but we may not want to allow that to happen. We may have to intervene at an earlier age so that it doesn't happen. And that is our messaging. Thank you so much. Our next question. Do we have data on the best antihypertensives for Indians? Oh, great question. So best antihypertensive 
So they studied that uh, in in black populations. So they found that uh, blacks respond better to calcium channel blockers. Uh, in some population, don't respond as well to beta blockers. The consistent response is with what is called RAS blockers, or renin angiotensin aldosterone blockers, which incur, includes uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and even the MRA or the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists such as panorolactone and some newer ones like phenerinone now, we believe may be an incredible agent for that population who has diabetes and chronic kidney disease to prevent progression of kidney disease and prevent onset of heart attack. So a lot of these are being studied, but it may be the RAS blockers that may be a better drug. The diuretic that people use as an antihypertensive may not be the ideal one because it does uh, increase your blood sugar. It does decrease magnesium level, decreases potassium level, risk of sudden cardiac arrest increases, increases kidney disease, uh, increases volume depletion. So we have to use diuretic because there is volume dependent hypertension. Then add a RAS blocker to that to balance all of the negatives of the diuretic. Do not ever use a diuretic all by itself. Thank you. And uh, this attendee is interested in knowing more about the various tests to confirm risk factors. Could you elaborate, please? I'm sorry, what is the question again? Various risk factors? Uh-huh. They're uh, so, interested in knowing more about various mm -hmm. tests to confirm so risk factors. So the test, yeah, so simple, simple. Number one, get your lipid testing, get your A1C, number two, get you know your blood sugar obviously, and then get your blood pressure, get a machine at home. Everybody should have a blood pressure machine at home and you should be checking it regularly on a regular basis when you're feeling not so good or when you're feeling too hyped up or angry or upset or something. Get Check your blood, blood pressure, blood sugar, A1C, cholesterol, get your cholesterol level checked every six months or if you already have high cholesterol, then every three months. And then... Uh, uh, check the lipoprotein little a. Go to your doctor, tell them today that I need my lipoprotein little a tested. Please test it for me, order it. The insurance will pay for that. And then if you're over the age of 30 and we, we, we are recommending the coronary artery calcium score, it used to be uh, $500. Now it's come down to $100. And if you go to Simon Med, uh, which is a, a, a an organization all over the country. Uh, we, through my nonprofit, we have a deal with them. If you put tell them twin epidemic, twin epidemic of diabetes and heart disease in ethnic community, if you tell them, Dr. Vijay, twin epidemic uh, for calcium score, they give it to you for fifty dollars. So I'm advocating we've been giving the coupons away with every uh, you know uh, health fair that we do almost on a monthly basis. We give it away. So calcium, if you do have some calcium that is more than 100, then you want to get this next test. And that is called the CT coronary angiography with the technology. There are two or three companies and one company that is doing some amazing work uh, is called Clearly, C-L-E-E-R-L-Y. I have nothing to do with them. I'm not, there's no conflict over here, but but uh, I've, I've really sent so many of them for Clearly testing and it uh, goes into the cloud and then comes back with all of the technology that tells you the plaque morphology, how much is, is truly stable, how much is now at risk, how much is soft, uh, what is yellow, what is green, what is red. It tells you all of that color-coded uh, plaque imaging. Don't go about doing carotids to abdominal to all of those surrogate markers. You want to know your artery, and if your artery is it got plaque and the plaque is at risk for rupture, then go straight to the coronary artery and let uh, do the imaging. And then you also measure the risk factors and you know, add these together and figure out how aggressively you want to uh, get yourself treated and be empowered. Don't be afraid. Be empowered about your health. You want to know knowledge is power. Thank you. Thank you. And we are running out of time, but I'll ask one last question. Is there a minimum age at which South Asians should consider medications like metformin or statins for preventative purposes, or should it be considered as soon as we see the relevant biomarkers climbing? Uh, great question. So if you have a risk, if you have pre-diabetes state, metformin is actually recommended already. There is an approval and indicated. 
Uh, well, there's other diabetic medications. There is no indication unless you do have diabetes or A1C is over 6.5. Now, having said that, uh, there is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is approved for weight reduction if you are above a certain threshold, which is causing something phenomenal. And, uh, and then if, if you have, if your LDL should be checked, uh, your cholesterol should be checked at age 10, according to the Pediatric Society. Every, uh, if we have children age 10 or above, get the cholesterol checked on all of them. And uh, if, if they have a higher LDL, there is no age limit. Pediatricians are, are giving statins. The, the one that is recommended it used to be called Crestor. Now it's called Rosuvastatin. Rosuvastatin is approved for pediatric population. And uh, so there isn't any age cutoff for LDL management for statins or uh, for diabetic medications. If they have type 1 diabetes, obviously they need insulin. The type 2 diabetes, I've seen type 2 diabetic in a 14 year old, 15 year old, young adults. I had a 19 year old who had an A1C of 10, which is huge, which is high. And it's type 2 diabetes. It is environmentally driven or on top of probably some genetic predisposition. You can't just dwell on the genetic predisposition. Oh my God, I'm going to get diabetes. I'm going to get heart attack. Go to the point. No, no, no. If you have a genetic predisposition, then you control all of the environment and you protect yourself from having an event and having a good life, having a good time feel healthy mentally, physically, and spiritually. Well, thank you again to Dr. Viajay and to our audience for your attention. We hope that you got something useful out of these discussions. As a reminder, a full recording of this webinar will be available on CMHC's website. We will also notify you by email when this becomes available. Please email info at cardiometabolichealth.org with any questions. Thank you so much, Chanel. Again, thank you for uh, the audience. Thank you for being here. Again, uh, as I say at the end, control your endothelial function. Make sure that you invoke your inner therapist, which is the title of my book that I wrote recently. That inner therapist is your own endothelium and invoke your inner therapist to protect yourself from all of the stressors of life, the psychosocial, the physical, and beat the odds of morbidity and mortality associated with onset of diabetes or onset of blood pressure or onset of cardiovascular event. I, I wish you the very best and I thank all of you for attendance and thank uh, the Cardiometabolic Health Congress for uh, inviting me and I'm totally humbled and honored by the invitation. Again, a big thanks. Thank you again, Dr. Piaget. And throughout this year, we have several meetings spanning a diverse range of topics. We invite you to join us for our master class focusing on women's health and wellness from August 17th through the 20th in Southern California. You can also join us in Boston for CMHC's 18th annual meeting, which will be held from October 11th through the 14th. Visit our website for more details. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.